Thank you all for coming tonight. We've got Mary Koss here to my left and Roxy on my right <laughs> due to technology. Let's see. So I'm going to give you a little bit about um, Mary Koss is an interdisciplinary artist known for her haunting installations that explore the human condition. She was born in Detroit, but Seattle is her home now. Um, recognized through awards and grants by the NEA, Ford, Puffin Foundation for Cultures, and many others, her numerous public work commissions are found throughout the Northwest. She exhibits nationally and in Northwest galleries, including ours, right there, and museums and sculpture parks. And that includes the Museum of Northwest Art, Bainbridge, and San Juan Museum of Art. One of her large public artist, artworks is the Ghost Lodge. So if you kid off the port over in Tacoma, take off the Point Defiance, turn left when you know when you go down past um, Ruston, if you keep going along there, you'll see her big work on the right. It's between the road and then the commencement bay there. She's built international partnerships that include exhibitions, residency, and culture exchange in places like Canada, Ireland, Turkey. And she's a co-founder of the Method Gallery and also CASA, a rape crisis center that flourishes after 30 years, as well as, as, well as the Borealis Light Festival. Now, Roxy is her daughter. <laughs> she is a musician, a composer, a band leader, an educator, and an activist, just like Mary. And she's um, become one of the most unique and innovative saxophonists on the scene. She is winner of the ASCAP Young Jazz Composer Award. The Downbeat Critics, Critics Poll listed her as the rising star category on soprano saxophone the past seven years, and they're calling her an exceptional young talent. Jazz's magazine has listed her as an artist to watch, and she's received the Hot House Magazine and Jazz Mobile Tenor Saxophone Award. She is beaming in from New York. She's a new mother and a touring musician, so we're glad to have got her at this point. And she is also the founder and president of Women in Jazz Organization, and she serves on the board for the Jazz Education Network and she's also a faculty member at Juilliard and artist in residency at ASU or Arizona State. So like I said, she's a new mom and beaming from us from New York, so I want to give them both a big welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is a strange uh, cross-platform experience we haven't, or I haven't done yet, so. <laughs> I, I at first felt like I was viewing you, so um, <laughs> you're viewing me. Um, but it's great to be here virtually. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi, Mom. <laughs> so we thought we would start by introducing ourselves. Although we've been introduced, we're going to take a little different um, tactic, and we're going to tell you how we ended up here. Um, so I feel like I've always been on this trajectory. My, um, my first memories are visiting my grandmother and using her um, oil pastels and just like taking that, that color and putting it on paper. And so there's, there's been, I, I come from a long lineage of artists and creatives, um, dancers, different, different forms of art. And so it's kind of, been in the family. I never really questioned it. I just thought I was going to be an artist. And um, today, when I was thinking about like how did I end up here, when I was in junior high, I had a teacher that took us to Detroit down to some galleries and to some loft studios. And I saw, oh, what a professional artist looks like, which um, I found really interesting. And so. Continuing on that path, I, um, I, went to, I went to school, and in graduate school, I, I learned to, um, I was always a maker, and I was always working three-dimensionally. But in grad school, I also fell in love with photography and video, and so it, I used that to bring it into my work. And I don't have any here, but I still do that today, where I introduce sound or other things into my art. Um, so I've been teaching, I've been doing design work. I, I did windows at Nordstrom and then ended up designing fashion show sets. So that was my corporate gig. And then I taught again. And over the years, um, 
I found it very, um, I love teaching junior high kids and high school kids, high school teenagers in particular. And so I've done a lot of mentoring and, um, and I was doing a lot of that when Roxy was young. And um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and obviously, you know, my mom's coming from a long lineage of creatives and artistic types and uh, coincidentally or not coincidentally, my dad is as well. And so for me, I, we were talking about this earlier today, my mom and I, and just how um, I feel that this, you know, how did I get here uh, as a jazz musician, which is really random these days, I think, uh, is kind of inevitable that it was the perfect marriage between a long line of musicians and artists visual artists and just creative people in general. And um, as we go through our creative process today, I think, you know, hopefully this will kind of be more clear to you all, but you know, what it means to be a visual artist is about having a voice. And so, you know, in music, that's not necessarily always the case, but as a jazz musician, that is the case. and. I think the biggest thing that spoke to me about the art form of jazz, in particular that genre, is this idea that you uh, develop your unique voice, that you're expressing yourself through the art form. So it makes a lot of sense to me, <laughs> now that we sit here on the other end of it, of making these decisions about our professions, that I ended up on this path given you know, the values and the culture in my family and just you know, valuing the arts and things like that. So, um, I started music at a very young age, and my first, my first memory um, is of music is you know being very young, maybe five, and sitting at the piano and just creating these worlds, like just sitting there, and that's when time would stand still or move really fast. You know, that's when I would get lost in time, and it's still the case today where I, if I get lost in the music, I kind of create my own world and and that's that thing that made me want to do it and I feel like music is the thing that I can't not do and so that's why I chose it and was very encouraged by my parents um, who are artists so it makes sense um, but I recently um, I like to share this little tidbit, which is I recently came across a home video from my uncle of my grandmother holding me when I was about two weeks old and blasting Count Basie, who is <laughs> one of the you know most influential um, big band jazz big band leaders that I ended up studying through high school and everything. So it, it kind of feels like it was meant to be. Um, but I think that these these backgrounds are important to also contextualize our process, which as we talked through it to plan for this, um, I think you'll hopefully see the parallels, which we feel is very strong. <laughs> so I'll hand it back to you, mom, to okay. kind of talk through your creative process. Um, and I, you know, both of us decided to lead you through this process through the filter of, um, or through the lens of how we create a single piece of work. Um, for my mom, you know, that's one piece of usually a visual art piece. Uh, for me, that's usually a composition. And that is just an example of our creative process, although our creative process applies to pretty much everything in our careers, in our lives even, um, whether it's starting an organization or um, creating the curriculum for a class or, you know, a anything in between. Um, we're going to focus on this as if we're talking you through creating one piece of art. So um, one thing I wanted to say also is that my, my art is a natural out outcome of who I am and I was also brought up in a very political family and so um, I, I have always been very social minded and um, there's a, a lot of conversations about human rights and people and people's stories. And um, so my work is always embedded with meaning. And that's one thing that we talked about today too, is that um, 
all of the work that we do is always embedded somehow with layers of meaning. Um, so just to talk you through my process, I was feeling very um, overwhelmed with ideas. And, and this is maybe a while back. Um, and I finally found a way to kind of wrap my mind around these ideas in order to lower my stress level. Because I would be like, oh, I want to do this. Oh, I got this idea. I got this idea. And then it's like, how do I get them done? And I'm feeling this pressure. I have to get all these done. But what I figured out was that I actually have this process that can hold a lot of, a lot of ideas in different places. And so um, it starts out with you know, inspiration. That's where we all start with our work. And it can be, it, it could be a story that I hear someone tell. It could be something that I see on the street. Um, one time I picked up this long bandsaw blade and I saw a hoop skirt. So, you know, there's different things that just would inspire me. And I would start to think about kind of, um, the metaphors that go with that. So the piece I'm going to talk about today to take you through this process is Three Graces, which is in the other room, it's um, the tall barbed wire pieces. So um, a lot of things feed into this processing stage. And um, so part of that is what's going on in the world around me and I was getting really um, frustrated by what was happening um, when they were trying to put the Affordable Care Act into place because they weren't addressing women's medical needs the same way they were looking at men's. And so there was a lot of talk about um, uh, being manhandled and not having control over one's own body. And so that was going on in the background and I saw barbed wire and I thought it'd be really interesting to do like, to use barbed wire as a, as a form of a boundary. So I was thinking about boundaries, women's boundaries. And, um, and eventually, you know, that all of that was just kind of going around in my head. Meanwhile, I'm working on other pieces, but this is just like processing. So that's that first stage. Um, and when I'm in that stage too, I'm thinking a lot about metaphors because it's very important to me not to specifically be didactic with my work. I want to share these stories in an allegorical form that, that has the audience, um, the audience is as important as the work. So the work's not complete without the audience. So I want to leave this open window for the audience to interpret. So I use a lot of metaphors and I use a lot of layers. And so all of that is part of that first part of the process, the processing. Then I go into my studio. So I think kind of that, that's all in my head. Then I go to my hands. So I go into the studio and I start playing with materials. And I think for me, this is a time when I get in the zone because I can just be like, experimenting and like what happens when I dip barbed wire in paper pulp or you know so I start playing around with like where do I want to go with this and what materials do I want to use and I start like making studies and doing small pieces that um, that can tell the story and it's usually during this period that I figure out for me like how the the best vehicle to tell this story is and my materials are always super important and they're integrated and inspired by this. And a lot of times I'm using text and incorporating that in. Um, so then I'm in my hands, that's the hand part. And then I, then I, then I go outside of myself. So um, at that point, I'm, I might have some small pieces that I actually will show somewhere or I have people over to my studio, or I start having conversations about the work. It, I think that it's a little bit dangerous to have the conversations too early with other people, but at this point, I'm already kind of working on these ideas, so then I start, so this phase is like about communication, and it's about getting input and thinking through like, well, you know, like I might have put something out there and I saw one thing, but everybody else in the room saw something different. I'm like, oh, okay. 
then I'm not telling the story the way I thought I was going to. And then I have to decide, do I want to tell the story my way or do I want to make it more clear? And so there's all this kind of negotiating with myself, like what's important in the viewer um, input and how do I interpret that and how do I hold my own voice while I interpret that. So that's that next part and then, um, and then that informs like how big should this piece be? Is it, it, does it need to be monumental or does it need to be super intimate? And um, you know, is it, is it something that needs an interactive component? Um, if my story's not clear enough, then maybe I need to add sound to it. Um, like on the, on the Three Graces, the first time I showed them, they were at San Juan Sculpture Park and they were out in this really kind of beautiful, it's called Poet's Cove down by the water. It's really, really beautiful. And they just, they, they felt like they worked there. And then um, I was given the opportunity to put those up in Tacoma at, um, there's these concrete, like ponds across from the art museum. I don't know if you know them. So, and it's, it's all like metal and, and cars going by and it's very urban. And I had these, um, the three graces are three young women I know. And I felt like they were vulnerable. Even though they were up on these, I, I put them up on these, these high, um, skirts in order to protect them per se it was like you can't touch me you can't get at me by my for my barbed wire skirt but so, all of a sudden i was kind of freaked out about putting them out in this public place because it was like i was i wasn't sure how they were going to be interpreted so i ended up painting on them and and i i did it kind of like henna but in my mind it was kind of like their war paint so they were being protected in some way um, and and then that piece, um, I felt like they needed, I, I felt like I needed more than one. I needed to have them in a group. They needed to be almost like a little small army. And so that's kind of how that whole thing developed. Um, <laughs> do you wanna show some of those sketches now or later? Uh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, okay. I so we're gonna do that in a minute. I have to get it <laughs> going. Oh, you can do it after you talk if you want. Um, let's do it now. Okay. So, um, all right. So Roxy suggested it to me that I um, dig out something that kind of shows that process. So I pulled out um, the first, before I made it, my first, um, it was a proposal in the beginning. It was a proposal to the San Juan Island Sculpture Park. So when I first made it, it was a sketch, and it was this sketch. Um, and I wanted to have um, this one, for some reason it was very important to me that this one person was covered and nobody else was. But, um, so that was my, my first initial sketch of this piece. And it's very similar actually to what I ended up doing. Okay, you can show the next one. And the next thing is just a process. So I started weaving barbed wire. I made some baskets just to, just to play around and, and experience that and to see what that was like and see how the material actually worked and if it was even possible. And part of um, what determined how big they are was the material because I really, I listen to the material a lot. It needs to dictate to me what I'm gonna do with it. Um, and then the next one is a picture of... Um, I'm gonna go down. Okay. <laughs> Kisa. So um, Kisa was one of my models and here we are in the studio just getting dirty. <laughs> and I just used plaster bandage for these. And then this is um, at the foundry. This is um, the aluminum that um, I, I put wax into that plaster mold. So this, I'm using lo, the lost wax process. And um, so this is right out of the furnace, these pieces. Um, okay, and 
there I am at, at the foundry. <laughs> And there I am in my studio, <laughs> again, with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, now I have to somehow stop. Okay, hi. <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay, I'm going to talk about my process now. And um, I'm using an example of a composition that I wrote called Mr. President, and it was sent out with the promotional materials for this talk, um, and I already know some of you in the audience, so maybe you've heard it before, but um, I, I will play a bit of it after I talk through the process for those of you who maybe haven't heard it before. Um, and I think interestingly enough, we, my mom and I have discovered through this um, conversation that our processes are almost identical, but in two different art forms. So my, my process also kind of goes through some phases. Um, and during these phases, as she was saying as well, I might, you know, be having different songs I'm writing or different projects I'm working on at different stages. Um, but if I'm writing a new song, for instance, um, I'll start with inspiration, the inspirational part of the process for me. Um, and this, for me, can be also coming from anywhere. I've, um, I, I collect a list of inspiration on my phone, like a, a memo app on my phone, so that when it hits me, I can write down that idea and try to remember it and remember how I felt in that moment. Um, because, you know, sometimes I don't feel inspired, but I have time to work on things. Um, and sometimes when I'm inspired, it is overwhelming, as, you know, my mom was saying as well. It's, um, it's just like, oh, I feel so inspired, but I don't know what to do. And that can actually stop you from doing anything. So I found that kind of keeping a running list of things that have inspired me um, helps me to later then move to the next process. And... Um, sometimes if I am in a rut, I, I, I reach out for inspiration, but usually I'm overloaded with it from everything in life. And my work is generally a pretty uh, clear reflection of whatever I am processing in my personal life. Um, I, you know, so Mr. President, as our example today, I wrote this composition during the election cycle for Donald Trump. Um, so during 2016, thinking about, you know, the media and how things were being per portrayed. And I wanted to portray this story that I felt like was, you know, from my perspective, what was happening. Um, so it can be something from the news. It could be something where I hear somebody else's music and I'm inspired by that. I, I think, oh, I really like the way that they had the bass player play the melody. I'm going to write a song where the bass player plays the melody. So it could be something very technical like that. It could be that I'm, you know, see, see a beautiful piece of art or I see a beautiful scenery. So I, I actually take inspiration from anywhere, but the next process starts to bring all these ideas together in the same way. So whatever that inspiration is, my goal is to create something physical, which is the sound itself, out of that ethereal feeling that I get from the inspiration. So it's not supposed to be a literal representation of what I'm writing the music about. It's more of a translation of how does it make me feel? And how do I translate how I feel into musical language? And whenever musicians, and especially jazz musicians, are talking about music and teaching, we always use the uh, analogy that jazz is a language. And when I was young, I thought like, okay, that means jazz is like a language, but as I get older and teach and <laughs> do music constantly, I realized that it's actually a language um, and you can become fluent in it and it's made up of phrases and vocabulary just like any language. Um, and so for me, the process of making a composition is actually, you know, expressing how I feel. <laughs> um, and so as I go to the next part of my creative process, which is 
to turn it into the physical. Um, and you know, so as my mom was saying, she goes to her hands. I also go to my hands. I sit down at the keyboard, which I have here, um, and I or the piano, um, which is the instrument I started on. And I start trying to find the sound of the feeling I'm trying to portray. And this gets easier in some ways as I get more experienced and as I get better with music technique, because um, I can find certain sounds and know what they are. But it also gets harder sometimes because I get in my own way, because I know what those sounds are technically. And as a kid, I didn't know what anything was. It was just either it was the right sound or it wasn't, and I didn't necessarily know how to find those sounds. So sometimes I actually just poke around without looking too closely at what I'm playing, <laughs> because I'm trying to get into that mindset of, I don't know what it is, I just have to respond to the sound. Um, but for instance, if I'm like, oh, I want to write a, a tune about my new daughter, and she's so cute and fun, and you know, then I know that I'm looking for some sort of positive sound. So I might, you know, go to my bag of tricks of positivity and, okay, okay, hold on, I'm gonna turn this up while I do this. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. We've got that. And then I might say, oh, but I want it to be a little mysterious. And I add a different interval. Now, all of those notes, I might say, okay, this is what I was thinking it would sound like, which instantly makes it darker. And I say, that's not quite right. And then I, I keep poking around. Not quite. Oh, there we go. That sounds stronger to me, right? So that's, that is what it looks like when I'm doing it um, and what it sounds like. And then I start to take notes on manuscript paper and I forgot to grab it, but I will because <laughs> I want to show you my chicken scratch. Um, and I start to write down these shapes and sounds. And as I go, once you have the, the first sound, I think of it as a puzzle. And you, you have to find the right puzzle piece that goes with the puzzle piece you've already committed to. And it's like you're putting together a puzzle that you don't have the cover box image of. So you know it's going to be right when you put it together, but you're not going to, you might not know until the very end <laughs> because you don't have a picture of what it's supposed to look like yet. Um, but I'll, you know, I just start, here's, here's a good one that I never finished. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, I should barely. I should have taken a picture, but it really just looks like chicken scratch and it's really just designed to get the ideas again into the physical. Um, and I write everything down and sometimes I have different versions I can't decide so I write it all down and then I usually sit and come back to it later and play it and say does this still sound good to me does this still make sense and does it give me that feeling that I was trying to portray and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't and that is when I start to make decisions um, and start to edit and start to cut and paste different sections um, and I'm moving into the third phase of my creative process which is to kind of refine and format and see how things flow and as I start to play it on piano is it missing something? Do I need a new section? Do I need a counter melody that goes along with the melody? Do I need some harmony lines? You know, when we go to play solos, I'm starting to imagine my band, so I'm starting to imagine it coming to life in reality. You know, how do we play solos? Are we soloing over the same melody that we started with, or is it a completely different section? And all of that, all of that, objectively, play along on saxophone. Um, and drag things, cut and paste, right, and edit that way. Um, at that point, I have like what I consider a rough draft, and I bring it to my band. And these days, I typically write for my quintet, which is also fortunate to know what you're writing for, because I would write something completely different for a big band or for a singer or, you know, depending on who's going to perform the music. But my quintet um, is instrumental, and it's saxophone, guitar, piano, keyboards, bass, and drums. So I kind of have an idea of how those voices can work together, who can do what part, what the roles are gonna be, and how we serve those roles. Um, once I play it with the band, 
it becomes very clear what edits need to be made. <laughs> um, and then, you know, at that point it's finalized. Once we've performed it, we can usually finalize it. And then it sits like that. Um, and one example, or one thing that my mom and I were talking about that we wanted to, you know, bring up tonight is that sometimes our work, like she explained with the three graces, sometimes our work comes back later in a new context. And for me, that means I've recorded all these songs and sometimes I play them on gigs and sometimes I don't. So I have songs that I recorded years ago, you know, 10 years ago and have never performed since. <laughs> um, and then I have songs that I recorded 10 years ago and have played almost every gig since. Um, and it's interesting which ones kind of stay important or which ones evolve and as I perform them which ones are still exactly the same way they were that first recording or which ones have completely morphed into something different um, and I think you know similarly it's context it's you know does this still ring true for me because I'm communicating and so does this still serve as a function for me to tell a certain story that I need to tell Sometimes I'm over that story. Sometimes I need to say it in a different way. I've learned new perspectives. And so that's how I kind of think about that. Um, I just simply get sick of things sometimes. And I think it definitely has to do with what that song was about. What story was I telling? Um, because sometimes I'm like, you know what? Let's try doing something completely new with this. And sometimes I just throw it in the trash after a while. Um, but I think that everything you know, musically seems valid to me when I look back at it because it, it was an honest expression of what was going on in that moment. And I think that's what making recordings is about for me and for many musicians, which is, it's just documenting where you're at in that moment. And it's a physical piece of that to, to hold on to. Um, so I, I'd love to play a little bit of Mr. President um, to kind of give you an example of how I turned that idea into a composition. Um, and so I'll just briefly, you know, describe what that is. And then we can listen just to the um, melody. Once we get to my solo, we can cut it off because it's a long track, but um, you can just listen to a little bit of that. Um, so I wanted to portray um, what I felt was uh, a media, <laughs> the media was portraying two candidates as if they were the same, right? They, it seemed like they wanted to have a story of a balanced option for the Democrat and the Republican uh, sides. And I didn't feel that was the case. I felt like it was ignoring an ominous undertone. And so in the composition, I wanted to portray chaos, which is how I felt <laughs> at the beginning. So you'll hear this chaotic section at the beginning. And then it settles. And I wanted to portray the main character I was writing about, Donald Trump, Mr. President. So you'll hear a march. And I was inspired by um, the Star Wars <laughs> Death <laughs> March or Death Star Imperial March, um, which is militaristic. And so it makes sense. Um, and then it starts to slow up. So each section after that, or speed up rather, each section after the march is actually in a cello rondo into a faster tempo. So you hear it start to get faster and faster and faster. And this is how I portrayed feeling like it was spinning out of control. Like how is, at every new week it was like, how is this happening and how is everyone okay with it? It was just like, it kept going and going. It was nuts. Um, and then, I have contrasting sections. So after this initial march, it goes into a swing feel. Um, actually, it goes into a, a straight eighth. It's sort of like a latin -y thing. And this is this, I wanted to portray the news, people pretending everything was okay. So it, you'll hear this sort of happy little melody. And then it goes into wait a second, there's really something darker going on underneath. And then it goes back to the happy and then dark, and then finally explodes into the solo section. And during the solo section, I wanted it to be so fast that we felt a little out of control. Um, and then it's just burning swing. <laughs> and then after I solo and Mickey solos on piano, we go back into the melody and do the whole thing again. Um, 
So I just want to take us through into the solos and then we can stop once I start soloing because compositionally that's the only new material. Maybe we we'll need to hear part of your solo. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they want to hear your solo. <laughs> you can stop when Mickey starts soloing. If you can play it, that would be great. That's the video, the YouTube video. Oh, 
almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't stop it before that, Roxy. <laughs> you let it go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know we were that, quite that close. I should have. Oh, I can't hear you unless you're on the microphone. Oh. Or facing this way. I think the audience wanted me to let it go. Oh. <laughs> um. Well, and it's, it's interesting, too, because I think um, you can see, too, that even though I'm writing music about a story that's being told, it's still following pretty uh, traditional jazz, like, compositional uh, format. And so it's got a head in and solos and a head out. Um, but within that, I am pushing the boundaries a little bit of different like subgenres of jazz. So there's some free jazz up front and then straight ahead swing on the solos and the melody or the head is a mixture of different feels. So we've got like some straight eighth and different grooves going on. So. Um, you know, if we're making a, a metaphor for art, <laughs> uh, visual art, then it's like, you know, mixing materials there a little bit um, in a way where a lot of uh, jazz musicians or jazz composers might just stick to one of those things per composition or per career. <laughs> so, um, yeah, trying to blur things a little bit. Um, so I guess, you know, we've both gone through our process, which you can see has <laughs> many parallels, and we've both given some concrete examples of what that looks like in creating a piece. And one thing we wanted to talk about is that the, the, the process for creating that individual piece, then we, ha we have all these multiple pieces that create a bigger, larger body of work. So for me, that might be an album, um, or, you know, for my mom, it might be, an exhibit um, and so both of us have you know done that where it's just like a random song or a random piece but mostly we're thinking thematically we're thinking larger scale how do I make this piece work within the whole and you know together creating something with a bigger impact so Mr. President was one tune on an album that was called the Futures Female and the entire album was a theme it was uh, compositions like feminist AF, hashtag me too, nevertheless she persisted. And I just kind of had this idea that these were memes, they were in the news, they were little snippets of what does this time period look like for women. And, you know, at the same time, parallel for me in my life was founding women in jazz organizations. So looking at this uh, not only how does how is the the female experience in society and politically, but also in jazz and and what does that look like for our future? Um, and for me, you know, I I do consider myself an activist through this work musically, but also through the work organizationally and socially, creating social change. But I think my music is not always such a literal act of activism. Um, that is the most clear uh, example of it. So I, I like to use that tune because it's, it's really easy to see those sections and everything. But my current work um, is not so overt. And I just wanted to kind of mention what that might look like in other work that I do. So my, I have a new album coming out, which we're going to talk about um, a little bit with collaboration as well. But um, I started with a suite of music about this idea of identity and it's the album is called Disparate Parts. And so I was thinking about how we have disparate parts of ourselves, especially as a woman in jazz where, you know, uh, Roxy mother, Roxy saxophonist, they're all in these little compartments. And um, so I wrote this suite about that idea of disparate parts and it has a uh, different tunes, the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit. And I'm gonna play the body at the end of the talk so you can kind of hear uh, what's happening next for me. Um, but that's an example of how I, I work and that is not necessarily overt activism, but it's still dealing with a very personal matter that I'm reflecting through these stories musically. Um, and I think, Mom, if you wanna talk about that a little bit too. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting to me that my, um, when Lynn invited me to show, it was specifically for this month because she saw my um, gender-based work and I do other, I, ha I have some other bodies of work, but, um, but this specific topic I have basically been doing my whole life. I've been doing it for 40 years. So when I was in graduate school, I was working on feminist work. What's interesting is how that's evolved over time, and this is actually um, about 11 or 12 years span in the work that is in the gallery. And um, one thing that's a little bit interesting, or, or um, I don't know, that's not the right word, I guess depressing, is that a lot what I was saying 10 years ago still needs to be said, and it's almost needs to be said louder now. And um, so, so I think that there is this kind of parallel reflection of what, what's going on in our lives and what we, how, how that manifests in our work. And when I was um, just out of grad school and I, was, I had been doing some feminist work, I started teaching and there were a lot of girls that were um, coming to me with, um, horrendous stories and it inspired me to start a rape crisis center with another teacher that I worked with in, in um, response to these girls really because we were on, in a small town way outside of the city and so they didn't have access there for those services. Um, so there's kind of been this parallel thing. I really, I, I do installation art and there's not a lot of places to show that, so I got together with two other installation artists and we started Method Gallery to support that. And so there's, there's these two threads that, um, that it's hard to separate, really. Um, so this, the next thing we want to talk about is collaboration. And um, the piece that is actually behind me here is a piece that um, that was part of an installation that originally there was a collaborative part to. So when I first showed it, there was actually a sound element in the gallery. So when you walk into the gallery, there was sound. And um, the, the work, I wonder, maybe you should start those slides. Yeah. So, so I was doing um, research on genealogy and I was writing in wire the names of my four mothers and I kept you know when you do genealogy you're chasing names all the time and so I'm looking for maiden names that are should be just as related as the the name that gets passed on but they disappear and so it was kind of like chasing ghosts they, they kept disappearing and I kept trying to find them and then when you find one you've just found the father's name anyways and so it really is kind of this ghost idea so um what I did was I, I, I wrapped the gallery in these names and um, I liked that they had these shadows because I felt like that was like this reflection of these, these intangible, like trying to grab that name. And, um, and it, it was kind of like a place of mourning because I was mourning these lost names and that's what um, that's why I, I built this pelvic bone and covered it in wedding gowns. And, um, and so I wanted, I wanted sound that was basically told the story of the life cycle. And my, um, my, my younger daughter, Sammy, who's with us tonight, is a tap dancer. And so I, I took Sammy to Jack Straw Studios and I recorded her tap dancing. And then I, um, I had Roxy, I asked Roxy to compose a song that was, or music that was like a life cycle. So it started out with a heartbeat and then the, the tapping came in and then Roxy put together a seven minute cycle of, um, of sound that kind of tells the life cycle. So it starts out like birth, just very quiet and then it gets more intense and then it gets the crazy 30s and 40s, and then it calms down again, and then it goes back to the heartbeat. <laughs> um, so Jesse has the audio, and maybe you can play it, but I, 
I don't think we should listen to the whole thing. Okay. Although yeah. I just listened to the whole thing again for the first time in years, and it's awesome. <laughs> Um, but maybe, you know, play a little bit at the beginning to yeah. feel that kind of slowness and then you can skip forward to kind of almost the end maybe, or even like the five minute mark might be cool. sent it after, sorry about that. <laughs> you have a music note on your face. It's just a soundtrack. Jump to about the middle of it.
Um, and I, I, I think what was interesting in that collaboration was my mom told me basically what she just told you. And she took Sammy into the studio. They recorded the tap at all these different tempos. And then she sent me those files, described what she wanted, sent me the heartbeats and said, you know, go at it. Um, so in that case, I felt like I was translating uh, the story from my mom into the language of music and then putting it out there. So rather than it coming from me, I was translating and that was a different process, but kind of the same process too, because I'm creating ideas into music. Um, and so putting the tap and the heartbeat and the saxophone together as three different parts, um, creating a whole piece of music, but telling this story that's coming from someone else. So that was fun for me. Um, and I think it's, it's cool to have, you know, the cross disciplinary elements working together too, because as a musician, I don't often get to do something that's going to be part of something larger like that, like walking into a <laughs> pelvic bone. <laughs> um, and then I guess, you know, we wanted to kind of show another more recent collaboration. Um, so for Disparate Parts, my new album that's coming out, uh, I was just, my mom was like, okay, tell me about your new project, you know, just like mom questions. <laughs> and I was, I started to describe what I, you know, what this suite of music was, what the album is about, these ideas of, you know, yourself. In that moment, I was, I had just given birth. So I really felt like <laughs> I was very um, in parts. <laughs> and uh, we were just talking through the concepts and the themes. And um, I had mentioned that I wanted real artwork for the, the art or for the album cover instead of like a photo of me or something like this. And so we just started to explore that idea and um, came up with this idea of what if we use a mask of my face and um, I will pull up some photos of what we ended up with but we just went from there and so my mom took the mask home and put it in some rubble and we wanted to use the wire words that are now her signature and um, we ended up with this and I will show you the album art. Um, so here's actually the single for which came out first. Um, the Body, which is the first tune in the suite. And then I'll open the album cover. Oh no, hold on. Ah! There we go. So that's the album cover. And uh, I, I took some pictures of the actual CD so you can see what it looks like. Oh, sorry, I'm dealing with multiple windows here. Put them all in there. So here's the cover in real life, <laughs> the back cover. And then this is the disc. And underneath the disc and the inside left. Um, and that's it. So, I don't know. I think it's cool to see it from both directions now that we've done that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the one thing that we were going to talk about that we didn't really touch on yet was just this, um, how we influence each other's work and I mean we, we t did talk a little bit about that but um, it, we're, it's like we're, because we're starting from this shared value system but we also have this shared aesthetic system and, um, and I was saying earlier that Actually, um, my husband and my daughters are my in-house critics, and I'm very dependent on them, and um, and I trust them, 
And uh, I think because they've just grown up knowing my work so well that they, they understand like what my messaging is and I, I always know like if I show them something that's bothering me that they're going to see it immediately and they always do so it's like this yeah that's right okay that's the thing okay I know I know I know <laughs> yeah um, yeah and, and I think you know for me thinking about what is this cross-generational idea right we're, we're giving a talk and we are two generations of artists um, I am obviously influenced by my mother because she's my mother. Um, but I think growing up in a household where we're, you know, talking about art, we're looking at art, we're talking about these values that we've been discussing today, um, and these aesthetic choices too, which go beyond visual art. So the idea of allegory, the idea of metaphors, and the idea of representing a feeling or representing an idea of pushing boundaries, of, of challenging people, engaging the audience in a way that's visceral or makes them think or makes them start to have a conversation or question things, context. All of that that my mom, I saw my mom do in art, I took and I'm trying to do that in music. Um, and I think I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be doing any of the stuff I do in my career if I hadn't grown up with that conversation happening all the time. Um, so it's, it's cool to see how that, now that we're both doing our thing, I can see myself in her in that way. And in her work, I see things that I'm reflecting in my work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Are you done? <laughs> yeah. We were going to, um, open it up to questions at this point. Malika. I've got two. Okay. One is like super weird and technical and the other is broad. Can you hear me okay? I can. Um, so the broad question is, it's really interesting to me that you both founded organizations, which are probably mm -hmm. nonprofits. Mm -hmm. But I would love to hear uh, the relationship between art making and founding an organization. Um, and the other weird technical thing is that I've been trying to post things to and they look like, you know what, back. And Wait, let me, let me just, um, yeah. can you hear her? Yeah. I could at the beginning, but it's, it's pretty hard. Okay, so the first question that she has is talking about um, how our working, like developing a nonprofit and our art careers segue. What's the relationship between the two? I to talk about the relationship the between the two, because yeah. she was surprised that we've both done that. Um, so hang on to that, and then what was the other one? The other idea is, um, that YouTube video of the Mr. President, visually and, and, and orally, is gorgeous. And anytime I load anything to YouTube, it looks terrible. So what's your secret? Like, what? She wants to know your secret loading to YouTube to keep the elegant, beautiful video. <laughs> you can answer oh, both. I couldn't. Did you hear what I said? No. Oh. <laughs> She wanted to know your secret loading to YouTube to maintain the beautiful imagery because hers does not load well. <laughs> Let's start with the first question. <laughs> I, I can't tell. I, I'm, I'm getting like every other word, so I think oh. that was a joke. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's kind of a technical question. Maybe we can talk about that later. Let's just focus on that first question and I kind of think that you should answer it because you have such a succinct connection between the album that you launched at the same time you were launching your your um, Weijo yeah. program. Well, when, so Weijo, Women in Jazz Organization, um, started in July 2017. I recorded The Future is Female, the album, September 2017. So I was very much percolating these ideas simultaneously, and they were both reactions to this uh, <laughs> election. Um, and it, so it started back in 2016, percolating, percolating. And um, I think 
all of my art, all of my music is just a natural, like, expression of whatever I'm going through. And so the music is going to reflect that. And so that happened to be the main theme in my life around that time. But I wasn't just feeling it as like a citizen, I, which I was, I was also feeling it as a woman in jazz. And so I happened to be going through some intense, you know, therapy, thinking about things I had gone through in my career specifically, or in my experience as a young woman in jazz and into a young woman living in New York and, you know, living in some pretty dicey neighborhoods where my daily experience from a young age has been traumas and continued experiences that trigger those traumas over and over and over again. And so seeing what happened in that election was very triggering in that way. And all of the things that followed, including the Brett Kavanaugh extravaganza, um, the, you know, all of that stuff was like, oh, this is happening in my career and now it's happening at the, the highest stage, the national stage. Um, so I had a reaction musically because that's what's gonna happen to, <laughs> to me no matter what's going on. And I had a reaction that was bigger than normal because it was reflecting all of my experience, pretty much. It was like compounding all of these things. And so I just needed something constructive to feel like I was actually doing something. Because if I, I feel like if you have that much anger and hurt and everything, and, and my healthy way to deal with it has been to do something. And if I don't do something, it just becomes destructive. And so at first I thought to myself, I need to quit music and actually like do something real. Like I should become a politician or I don't know, how do I change this? This is unacceptable. Then I thought, well, I'm not gonna like, I've just trained my whole life to do this thing. <laughs> I'm not gonna just stop doing what I'm doing, but maybe I can make a change in my own community and maybe I'll actually have much more power there and much more influence there and I can make bigger changes there because I've been in this community my whole life. Um, and so what does that look like? What can I change? Let me start with people like me, women in jazz, let's get together. And there were, there were things that had come together like uh, touring experiences where I had a chance to connect with other women and realize that we were all feeling very similar, that we had all gone through really similar traumatic experiences and that sharing those stories was super important because, you know, all of us are very isolated in the community. And so when you're isolated, you feel like you're crazy. You feel like it's your fault and you feel like you're the only one going through that. And so it became very clear to me that there was a, a huge need for connection of women in jazz in order to change our individual experiences, our community, and the greater jazz world, which hopefully will benefit everybody, not just the women in jazz. You know, it'll benefit audiences, it'll benefit men in jazz, it'll benefit everybody. So to me, um, it, it was a way to try to improve my general experience in jazz and uh, it, it, you know, that album coming out was like a simultaneous musical statement of those feelings as well. Um, so continuing the work with the organization and now has spilled over into my educational work because I go around the country leading master classes and talking about gender issues and working with students and bringing these ideas to their attention. So I've begun to more now combine these ideas in everything I'm doing, in the way I teach music and the way I, you know, put out albums, it's it's a consideration. For instance, I did a residency at Smoke Jazz Club where I presented trios for an entire fall, like once a week. And I very much kept in mind that I wanted each trio, I, I got a different band every week and I wanted to kind of make a statement quietly that you can book a representational diverse band every week of different people and so I did. Um, there were I would say an equal number of men and women and very racially diverse and identity diverse and sexual preference diverse uh, group of people. Um, they weren't necessarily age diverse just because of the amount that it paid <laughs> but um, 
<laughs> I, you know, so I, I think all the work I do now is trying to be more encompassing of all of these ideas. And I think you can just be a musician and just do it through your art, but um, the experience of the artist, and somebody needed to do it. And I happen to like some of the work that you have to do in order to do that, like spreadsheets and um, <laughs> I don't know, things that you need to do. I like doing that stuff, writing and website design and all of that. So it worked out okay. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, my, my work, there's, um, there's meaning embedded in everything. And I think that just like, when that, it's like, it's off the page. It's like working on the social justice issues separately is just another, you know, another outlet for that. And, but I also think that, um, Anybody here, because I see several professional artists in the audience, know that to be an artist, you you have to know how to do everything, and so it kind of primes us to be somebody to start something. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. There's a quote from. Wayne Shorter, that is my favorite. <laughs> He's my favorite and the quote is my favorite. Um, music is a drop in the ocean of life. And musicians get really like, oh, music is life. Music is the only thing that matters. And music, music, music. And um, I love that quote because it's, it's just like, you know, if you're a musician or if you're a, just any person who likes music, um, music is just one part of it. And so if you're a musician, that's important because that's just one way you express yourself. And it's also just one way that you enhance your life or that you can communicate. And all of the other things in life are important in order to inform the music. You know, you can't have it, you can't have music without the other stuff. And so I could just express myself musically, but I felt the need that other stuff too and I, I continue to but maybe someday I won't I don't know yeah anyway <laughs> thank you all for listening and coming thank you, thank you.